My name is John Baldwin. I'm a FreeBSD committer developer for a while, since 99 or so. So it's coming up on 20 years of, I guess actually, it's like 20 years of having to commit, but like three weeks ago or something ridiculous like that. Um, but today what I'm here to talk about whew, uh, is a project I've been working on uh, myself for about the last year or so, but a project that at Netflix in particular has been ongoing for much longer than that. Uh, so I get to kind of present and talk about the fruit of a lot of people's efforts. So just keep that in mind as we're going through this. And what we're going to talk about is um, tr actually doing something that's a little backwards. We're putting more complexity in the kernel. Um, and the name of performance, which is why we normally do these sorts of things. And we're particularly going to talk about um, accelerating the performance and the bandwidth we can do with trans transport layer sockets, or TLS, uh, by putting some of that into the kernel. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time at the beginning talking about why to do this, because I can tell you when I first was talking with Netflix for quite a while ago about some of the some projects even related to this, I was very skeptical. Because normally we don't like to have complexity in the kernel. It's harder to bug, debug things in the kernel, right? It's much nicer to have useLAN programs that crash because then they just crash and you restart them and you know that's, life is fine. Um, so I want to spend some time talking a little bit and fleshing out why do this? You know, why, why take this kind of approach of moving uh, this work into the kernel? Uh, once that's out of the way, then we'll spend some time talking about kernel TLS, a little bit of the structure. Um, I don't have three hours, so the detail is going to be kind of a little bit high level. I can't get it so deep. Uh, and then we're going to, uh, after talking about the framework itself, there's two main modes currently that TLS operates in. One is called Software TLS, and one is called Nick TLS, and we'll talk more about what those are. And then I have some numbers at the very end. Um, and if we have to, we'll skip some of the middle bits to get to the numbers, because probably you mostly care about the numbers. Um, but I find the work interesting. So why do this? Why? think about moving TLS encryption and so forth into the kernel. Um, and to really understand why we want to do this, it's kind of a repeat of the story we had um, in our universe about 20 years ago, or a little over 20 years ago, um, which is the story of why we added a specialized system call called SynFile. And so let's start with talking about SynFile. And I think if we walk through that, then it much, becomes much easier to explain why we would do this with TLS. So before we had SynFile, let's kind of walk through what the workflow would look like if you're a typical web or FTP server, because SynFile was also an FTP thing, because that existed 20 years ago. Um, so we're going to start off on user land. Uh, we're, we have some data that we want to send, in particular the contents of a file we're going to send to a client over a socket. We have to allocate some memory in user land, right, call malloc or something. So we have some memory, our little green pages. My lizard pointer doesn't quite get far enough. Oh, it does. Um, but we have some memory allocated in my little green pages. We want to get them off of the disk and eventually out to the network. So we're going to start off by calling read, wonderful system call. And when we call read, we're going to go inside the kernel. And the kernel now needs to find its own set of memory to put this data in. Um, if you're lucky, it actually already has the data for the file, and so it's going to go find the pages inside of the buffer cache that have this. But if you're less lucky, then we actually have to go talk to the disk. So if we go talk to the disk, we're going to construct some suitable IR request, go to our disk controller to say, hey, go find this data and read it back. When the disk is done, it's going to find the data that we want, and then it's going to copy that data into the pages inside the kernel using DMA. So now we have our data. That's all good. Now at the conclusion of our read system call, we have to copy the data that we got from the file, from the disk, uh, back out to your memory in user land, where you wanted it, because read is kind of one op self-contained operation. And then immediately, in user land, we're going to turn right back around from that read call and call write to send this data back out the socket to the connection we're trying to talk to. And we call write, we go back inside the kernel, and the kernel now has, has to allocate another set of pages, anonymous pages in this case, that get stored as mbuffs in BSD. Um, to hold the data that we're going to send down through the socket and protocol layers eventually to the NIC. And so we've got to copy the data out of the user land pages into this second set of pages inside the kernel. And then finally, once we have our inbuffs ready, we have the data in the inbuffs, we can now send requests off to the NIC to schedule transmission. And then when the NIC itself is processing the transmission, if we're not using something from really old, um, it's going to do DMA and it's going to read the pages out. So we've now stored 
three copies of the data at best, um, and we've copied it around several times. And we've bounced in and outside of the kernel. And then the last thing is, maybe our file is actually quite big, so we have to do a loop of this. We have to keep doing this over and over again, invoking several rounds of system calls with lots of bouncing in and out of the kernel and user land and so forth. So we'd like to make this better. So the first thing we might think about doing is what if we could take the data that we got from the disk and just send that to the NIC, right? We already have the data inside the kernel. It'd be really nice if we could just send that directly to the NIC and not worry about copying out to user land and copying into yet another set of pages inside the kernel already. So that would be kind of cool. And if, if, we, can, if we can manage to do that, um, actually, then it turns out we all need all this other kind of stuff in the lower left-hand side. And so that's what the SYN file system call does. A SYN file system call um, is asking the kernel to do something a little more abstract. We're saying, we want you to directly copy data from a file to a socket. And so when we do SYN file, userland gets to make a single system call. So you don't have to invoke a loop with a bunch of reads and writes. That single system call goes inside the kernel and says, hey, find some pages of memory, read the data from the disk, or if it's already cached, we can use the cache cages from our buffer cache, and then send that data, you know, repackage those pages up as inbuffs and send them down directly to the NIC without making any more copies. So the only copies we might possibly have is to DMA it out of the disk and straight into the NIC. And so that's way more efficient. And when we did this, it made our web servers and our FTP servers at the time far more efficient because we got rid of a lot of kind of busy work and making extra copies of things, right? In fact, one of the names for a SYN file, the kind of the way it's described as a zero copy, which we still have to copy it out of the disk into the pages, but we're not making these extra copies, right? If you look back at our previous slide, we've got three copies of the data. In the SYN file, we're back down to one copy. So now that we've talked about that, let's go look at what happens when we use TLS. So one of the things to understand about TLS, um, which you may already know, um, when TLS is working with data, it is a kind of an application layer protocol. So it's above TCP, and it has its own structure for that protocol, which means it has to package data up into its own kind of framing. Um, and those framing, and, and when we're passing data, we're storing data into these kind of big packets that are frames. And those frames have a couple of things. Um, the first thing they have is some header. Uh, it's a very small little header, but in particular, it says how much data this record contains. Also, it tells you what type of data it contains. Most of the time, it's just a kind of application data to pass to the application to the other side, but there's also some control messages used for things like key negotiation and so forth. Um, then we take the data, and as the point is security and privacy and so forth, which we're not going to spend a lot of time on today, we encrypt the data. So we, make, we do some kind of transform to the data to make it look different than, than the actual plain text data that the user, the application itself is working with. And then finally, we're going to append a trailer to uh, the record. Now, usually this holds some kind of authentication data to verify that the record is valid for the purposes of what we care about. Um, so there's a couple of things to conclude from this. Um, well, and the last point, I guess, Right now, in our existing kind of workflows, all this framing is done in userland. So you use a library like OpenSSL or LibreSSL or some other bare SSL or there's GNU TLS. We have several of these. Um, they're all running in userland, and they are doing these operations to transform chunks of application data into a TLS frame. Right? So we have to modify the data, and it also gets a little bigger. So let's now go look at what kind of a current day uh, HTTPS workflow kind of looks like. So we're going to start off in userland still, because we've got to do the framing in userland. So we have pages of memory in userland. We're going to call read to kind of get to get the data from the disk, just kind of like we were before. So we've got to allocate pages inside the kernel to hold the data from the disk itself. We'll go ask the disk for them. They'll come back via DMA, and then we're going to copy them back out to userland. Um, then, in userland, we're going to do some kind of modification, massaging of this data to turn it into uh, suitable TLS frames. We might allocate like a separate set of memory and actually copy the data, or we might modify it in place, but we've got to do this work to modify the data. So I made it purple to say that it's, it's modified data now. And then finally, once we have this modified data, we're actually going to send it over the socket. At this time, we're going to allocate data yet again inside the kernel to hold the in-kernel copy of the encrypted data. So we've got a copy into that, and then we can finally send it to the NIC. And the NIC's going to DMA the data. And then lastly, we're sending a big file. We've got to do many cycles of reading and writing to this all over. 
So if you look at this picture, this looks an awful lot like the workflow we had before SynFile. So when we switch to using plain HTTP to using HTTPS, the benefits that we got from SynFile 20 years ago just go right out the window. <laughs> like, whoops, sorry. Um, so we lose all that kind of performance gain we have. We're back to having the overhead of bouncing, inside, of bouncing back and forth between user and the kernel. We're back to making multiple copies of data. They're not quite all identical anymore, but we do have nominally three copies of the data again, just like we did before. And as a result of this overhead and so forth, we can't achieve the same bandwidth uh, with HTTPS that we could achieve with plain um, HTTP. So in particular, Netflix ran into this when they got to a point where they could, with some, a lot of work they had done, they could push 100 gigabits over plain HTTP. But they had a mandate that they wanted all their traffic to switch to TLS at some point, like maybe like very soon. I don't work for Netflix, I only contract, so I can't speak to all their details. But they have a mandate to do that, so they had to figure out how are we gonna push 100 gigabits or more in the future using TLS. And so the goal, kind of, of what we're doing with KTLS or kernel TLS, we're trying to get to a more ideal workflow that's a lot more like SynFile. And in practice, what it really means is we wanna find a way that we can use SynFile for a connection using TLS. And so that's what the KTLS work that's recently now in, in FreeBSD 13, that's what it's oriented around, is how do we get back to a way, or what, how can we provide a way that we can use SynFile on a connection using TLS? So what are some things we need to have available in order to do that? In particular, what are things that we need to have inside the kernel? So one thing we have to do, for, in order for SynFile to work, um, right, we don't want to have the data go out back to useLine and come back. So any kind of modifications or massaging of the data that's going to happen between the disk and the NIC, we want that to now happen inside the kernel. So we have to have some way that we are going to be able to take raw file data off the disk or out of the buffer cache and modify it, massage it, whatever you want to call it, to turn it into proper TLS records or TLS frames that we can then send directly to the NIC. So we need some way to do that. Um, in order to do that, we have to be able to do the encryption part, and that means that we need to have information in the kernel to tell us for this particular socket or a connection, how are we going to do those modifications? So we have to have things like um, the session keys for the current session that we use to do the actual encryption. We also have to know kind of what encryption algorithms we're using, because it turns out there's more than one to choose from, um, and some other data similar to that. We also still need the ability, in case um, OpenSSL or whatever user on library requires it, we need the ability to still send uh, special records that aren't application data. Most of the time, we're going to be sending raw application data, like the equipment, what we're going to send as part of a file with send file, but we can't completely kind of hose the protocol. We need some kind of bypass that if Userland needs to send an alert for some reason, uh, they still have the ability to send a record that's not application data. And then lastly, and this one's not but so hard, but it is kind of, you have to do it. Um, TLS records are bigger than the data that they encapsulate because of the header and the trailer. So we need to make sure that just as we did when we did this on Userland, TCP is still aware of the fact that the records are bigger, and that gets accounted for when TCP is figuring out how much data it's sending in terms of its sequence numbers, how much data is getting act, and so forth. We have to preserve the fact that even if we don't have the frame uh, or the headers or the trailer fully populated at certain times, we're still accounting for them so that TCP always believes that there are full frames. So what are some things that we don't actually have to do in order to do SIN file with TLS? So one thing we don't have to do is we don't actually have to try to handle key negotiation and like public key cryptography in the 87 ways you can compute your session keys inside the kernel. We can still let that happen in user land. So we can let a connection start up normally as it would. We can let OpenSSL or whatever library do its thing, figure out the session keys, and only when we get to the point that we want to start sending bulk data down and we're, out, we're now kind of at the application stage, of, the, of our process or our connection, that's the time at which we actually need to opt, that's the use case we need to optimize. Uh, we're not, we don't have to worry about solving this particular problem for like a workload targeted with using send file. It's also called send file. So we don't really need to solve the problem of receive offload. Uh, we only are focused in this case on transmit. And in particular, for Netflix's use case, but it is true for many other kind of 
web server use type use cases, you have a pretty imbalanced traffic. Now, this won't be true of DNS, which has really tiny little packets that are all the same size. But if you're downloading big static content, you have much smaller received traffic. And a lot of the received traffic you have during your bulk phase doesn't have any application data in it. It's just acts, right? Which, and so acts don't even don't contain TLS records anyway. So we don't have to solve the problem of how do we uh, do TLS receive in the kernel. We can actually just kind of preserve the existing receive path back to user land and let OpenSSL deal with decrypting any TLS records that come in on the receive side. We only really have to focus on solving the send side. So what are kind of the pieces that we have inside of KTLS that we're going to use to address the things that we need to solve? The first thing we have is we have a data structure uh, that represents a TLS session, uh, some, a TLS session object, which we'll talk about. We have to have some method that we can store a TLS frame or TLS record inside an mbuff because we're going to be sending them down to the NIC and we're going to be storing them in socket buffers, letting TCP look at them and so forth. And all that world uses mbuffs to manage its data. So we need to have some way of representing the fact that this is a TLS frame or TLS record inside the mbuff. Um, then we need to make sure that once we have switched into this mode, all data written through the socket needs to be treated as, needs to be properly formatted as TLS frames. You can't have like random data that's not TLS intermixed with TLS frames. That's not the way the protocol works. It can't handle that. So anything, once we switch into a mode where we're going to use KTLS, we need to ensure that anything ever written to the socket from userland, by whatever means, gets packaged up in a TLS frame and is framed appropriately so that on the wire you always have valid TLS frames. Um, and then, so we, so we have some way of dealing with framing data. Um, then we have two kind of, currently two different ways of how do we actually deal with converting unencrypted TLS records to TLS encrypted records before they go out onto the wire. The first one we'll talk about is something we call software TLS, which involves kind of using some kind of component, of the, traditionally software, although it turns out there's some hardware versions that work as well, um, but some way of transforming the data kind of before it hits TCP. And then we have a second mode called NIC TLS, which works by, um, in certain cases, there are certain NICs that have the ability to kind of do the encryption and segmentation in the NIC itself as part of transmitting. Kind of like the way TCP segmentation offload works, right? When you do TSO, you give this kind of large TCP packet to the NIC and you tell the NIC, here's the pieces you should carve it up to and the NIC is responsible for carving it up into smaller pieces and using a template kind of TCP IP header at the beginning to fill out the individual TCP IP headers. Well, with NIC TLS, we can kind of do the same thing with a NIC. We can say, here's a TLS record and like here's some handle or maybe we've stored keys for this session on your NIC somehow. Here's a TLS record. Here's the bits you need to figure out how to encrypt it. So encrypt it, take that encrypted output and then feed it through your TSO engine to chop it up into little blocks again and send it out as a stream of TCP segments. So that's NIC TLS. So let's walk through these things, kind of these components a bit. The first one you mentioned were TLS session objects. And what a TLS session object, it's just a data structure. Um, and it's kind of your handle or your descriptor for state about a TLS session. So this is what the thing that will actually hold um, the algorithms you're using, which ciphers you're using for your, for your session keys. It'll also hold the actual keys itself. We have a new socket option that we've added uh, for KTLS transmit called TCP TX TLS enable. And when you invoke that socket option, uh, you pass a data structure that has things like your keys and what algorithms they're using and so forth. And we used information from the socket option to construct one of these objects and then find a suitable backend to handle the TLS part. And then we change the socket send buffer to have a reference to this current object. And we're going to make use of that, that any time we are writing data now to the socket going forward, we can find what kind of TLS session parameters we're using and use that to construct the TLS frames for all the data that goes into the socket from this point on. So the next thing we talked about is we need a way that we can have mbuffs be aware of the fact that they're holding TLS frames. And in particular, um, in the case of the NIC, when you're doing TLS in the NIC, it has to go all the way down to the NIC and still look like a TLS record, and we understand it's a TLS record with some kind of session it's attached to so we can tell the NIC exactly what to do. So we have to have some special kind of mbuff that knows that it's a TLS frame and not just kind of random data. 
So there's a lot of backstory that I can't cover in this talk. <laughs> um, but one of the things Netflix did, even when they were early on and it, and it became a dependency of doing KTLS, um, is they added this new external mbuff type. So mbuffs can have, you can have a simple mbuff that just has data inline, but when you want to store a large amount of data, you can have mbuffs that kind of have an external reference to some kind of arbitrary buffer. And we have, so an mbuff cluster is a common one that we use all over the kernel, which is you have a 2K buffer, which is how we normally receive 1500 MTU frames and so forth. But we have the extensibility to have arbitrarily kind of different types of external storage. And so they added a new type of external storage um, called external pages that actually holds an array of physical page pointers. Um, traditionally, when you were doing send file, you would actually allocate an mbuff for every page. So when I had all those kind of pages, even in the send file case for disk and I.O., we would actually have an mbuff per page, and you would have a, a linked list of all those mbuffs inside your socket buffer for when you're sending data out through TCP. Well, if you're sending a really big file, you can still end up with a pretty long linked list, and you're taking lots of cache misses as you're walking this linked list at all the pointers they're in. So what external pages does is it actually kind of allocates a data structure that can hold, uh, I think, somewhere around 16, 19, 20 some odd pages. And you can have a single mbuff that it can represent you know, 15 to 20 or so, depending on your architecture, page pointers directly in one mbuff. And so you take these long linked list of pages you had in the SIN file and you compress them down to like one tenth or one fifteenth of their size. And then you have fewer cache misses because you're walking all that. And that was something that um, they'd had for several years but got upstreamed kind of, I think like late spring or early summer. I got a chance to commit that. Well, in KTLS, what we're going to do is we're going to reuse this data structure and we're always going to ensure that Every time we have a TLS frame, it's going to consume exactly one of these special kind of mbuffs. And then we're going to extend the data structure that is kind of the backing store for these external pages and buffs to add some new fields to hold TLS data. So we're going to, um, we're going to have a reference, a pointer uh, to the TLS session object, which says what set of keys and so forth we're going to use. Uh, we also have copies of the TLS header and trailer that get stored in line as opposed to the, uh, one of the properties of the external pages and buffs is we're not storing virtual addresses of the actual application data. We're only storing physical pointers because most NICs do DMA and they don't need it to have mapped anyway. And if you don't need to create an artificial mapping just to destroy it again, as you do in a traditional mbuff if you want like a jumbo 9K mbuff or something, um, you can avoid kind of doing TLB shoot downs and craziness and dealing with KVA, you can just bypass all that. Um, so because of that, uh, you, it's not easy to get to the data necessarily inside a, TLA, a external pages in buff, but the header and trailer, we kind of need to generate pretty easily. So we have little inline arrays to hold the header and trailer kind of a sideband uh, to the app application data. And then when we're setting up a TLS frame, we'll make sure that mlin, so the length of the in buff, is set to the full length of the TLS record. So it includes the length of the header, the length of the kind of payload data that we have inside of the in buff, and the length of the trailer. So how then are we going to actually, when we're invoking a syscall or doing something to append data, how are we going to deal with converting those into frames? So once you've kind of invoked the socket, the socket option, you've created a session object and flipped the socket into KTLS mode, from that point forward, all the data that you write into the socket is going to get stored as TLS frames. So um, and any of the system calls that are going to work on the socket, whether they're send file or write or AO write or any other path, um, from that point forward, they always will never allocate plain mbuffs or mbuff clusters. They're always going to allocate one of these external pages mbuffs and to hold the application data. So they'll, if they have to allocate pages, like in the case of write, they'll allocate pages and then they'll store the page pointers inside one of these mbuffs. And that's what they're going to use to, to eventually queue into the socket buffer. And then once we've actually con constructed one of these external pages mbuffs, then before we put it in the socket buffer, we're going to call this function called KTLS frame. And KTLS frame is actually, at the point that we are kind of reading the data, we're just storing the application data in the mbuff, and like the length of the mbuff is how much kind of application data is in the mbuff. When we call KTLS frame, that's a function that expands it into an actual TLS record. It figures out, based on the session object, how long our header is, how long our trailer is. And we'll, we'll get into more of that in a second. But we're, we're going to take this extra step to logically transform an mbuff from just holding plain data to holding a TLS frame before we put it in the socket buffer. So most system calls 
um, they're just sending application data. And so things like write or send or even send file, um, when they are calling KTLS frame to figure out what kind of, to kind of package up their data into a TLS record, they hard code the fact that this is an application data frame because that's what they're sending. They're just sending data to the application at the other end once it kind of pops out of TLS at the other end. But we mentioned earlier we need some kind of back door. We need some kind of way to allow occasionally um, an ability to send a TLS record that's not just pure application data. Like if OpenSSL needs to send an alert for some reason. So with send message, uh, KTLS adds a new little control message. So you can construct, you know, with send message, you can have control messages that you kind of stick in the message header you can pass along. There's a new control message called TLS set record type that as, it, as its payload has a single little eight byte value, which is an arbitrary record type. So you can construct an arbitrary TLS frame by calling send message. You can set the type with TLS set record type and the contents of the message portion you're passing to send message is treated as kind of an atomic unit. That whole thing gets stored in exactly one TLS frame, fully self-contained. So if you need to send an alert, um, or if you need to send something related to key renegotiation, although we currently don't do that on KTLS, um, you can use send message to do that for your special messages coming from OpenSSL or whatever library you're using. So I mentioned this function KTLS frame when I started talking about it, but let's talk a little bit about what it's going to, what it does to transform each kind of plain data mbuff into a TLS frame mbuff. So it looked at the, the current so uh, socket send buffer and looks at what TLS session object is associated with that socket and it's going to use that to figure out what are the parameters for this particular mbuff going forward. And in fact, it's going to save a reference to the socket buffer's TLS session object inside the mbuff. So the mbuff from then forward, it's, it's reference counted, and so it knows, it's, knows exactly its session parameters. And the session goes away in the future, but the mbuff is still alive. It'll still be valid until the mbuff is finally finished and goes away. So we do that. Um, we also figure out, based on the parameters inside the session object, how long our header and trailer can be, because those actually vary depending on what cipher suite you're using. Uh, in particular, like for if you're using ASCBC, um, CBC requires you to do encryption on 16-byte boundaries. And so there's a set of variable length padding you have to account for. You can actually make arbitrary long padding, but we just kind of do the smallest you can possibly do. But we, we figure out at the time we call KTLS frame, based on how long the payload is, how much framing data, like how much padding we need, and fully compute the full length of the header and trailer. And then we use that to set MLIN. And then lastly, at this point in time, we actually know enough to figure out the full TLS header. The trailer, you have to kind of use your cipher to figure out because it depends on your authentication algorithm as part of your, of your cipher suite. But the header um, is plain text that gets passed in the open. Um, and so we can actually fully populate that. We set like the version and the length and so forth. And usually you have some kind of, well, most of the time, you have some kind of explicit IV that's also in the clear and we will generate that and store that in the TLS header at this time so that the contents of the TLS header are what are going to be on the wire eventually. So those are kind of the components. We have this TLS session object. We have um, TLS mbuffs, an mbuff that holds a TLS frame. And we've talked about how to build those. Now, we've, and we've got to the point where um, we're kind of ready to glue the pieces together, I guess is a good way to put it. So let's talk about the two different modes we can use. Yes, look at the time. Oh, it's counting down, okay. So let's kind of talk about the two different modes we can use to deal with the final transformation and kind of how we turn these, these kind of pseudo TLS records because at the time that KTLS frame finishes, the data is not encrypted yet. So we have a kind of an unencrypted TLS record and we don't have a trailer yet. So we have to figure, we have to solve those two problems. There's two different ways. So in software TLS, um, when we create the TLS session object kind of back in the sock socket option, we go and find some kind of software backend. And we actually have, KTLS has a way that you can have multiple kind of backends with different priorities. So if you have ones that are more optimal, like they perform better, which we will talk about at the end. Um, you can prefer those to ones that are slower. Um, but if you have to use the slower one as a fallback, you can. So they have some kind of notion of who am I going to ask to do the encryption on my behalf when it comes time to encrypt an MBUF. Um, and then 
once we have put the data kind of into the socket buffer as part of the system call, then we're going to schedule it to be encrypted. And we're going to kind of do that before we actually send it to TCP. So once we're going to schedule it by, to be encrypted using, uh, we have a worker pool of threads that will deal with kind of encrypting frames. And once a frame is encrypted, we can kind of release it to TCP to say, now we're ready to send this data down to the, the NIC. And then once, once we've finished the encryption at that point, um, even though we kind of, the NIC has to be aware of the fact that the header and trailer are part of the special MBUF, for the most part, it's now kind of just a normal MBUF. You don't have to be, really know that there's kind of encryption state stored with it anymore. So we can actually drop the reference to the session object at this, the TLS session object once it's been encrypted. So let's look a little bit at kind of the workflow we get with software TLS. So we're going to call SynFile. And when, when using SynFile with software TLS, we're going to call SynFile. And we're going to allocate pages just like we would normally, or we're going to find pages in a buffer cache like we would um, if we're using SynFile in the kernel. And we've got to get it off the disk or in some way. Then we're going to actually do the TLS framing step inside the kernel. So we're going to modify the pages inside the kernel to turn them from green pages to purple pages. And then once that's ready, at that point, we send it down into TCP and ultimately down to the NIC. And that's kind of the high level workflow of what that looks like. So with SynFile, let's drill down a little bit more, subject to time, sure, of what that looks like for SynFile and for write, because they're, they're, the cases are a little bit different. So the send file, when send file is running, it's going to make sure that it has to follow the rule of using these special external pages. So we're going to make sure and allocate external pages in buffs to hold the, if the file page is coming in off disk. And then when the way send file works is if the data is not ready, um, which oftentimes it's not if, you're, if your data isn't cached yet, then we have a callback. We schedule disk I.O. to happen. And when the disk I.O. completes in the disk interrupt handler, we kind of have this callback, send file I.O. done, that gets called. Um, and normally what happens in normal, in normal send file, so I should back up slightly, um, we have this feature called uh, inbuffs that can be not ready. So normally we call send file. We'll, we'll kind of allocate the pages even if we don't have them from the disk yet. And we'll wrap them in inbuffs and stick them in the socket buffer. But we'll set this special flag called M not ready which tells the socket buffer to kind of reserve space. So you know, if you're full, fill up so you can't write more data in the socket buffer to apply back pressure. But if the data is not ready, you can't actually pass it down to TCP yet. You have to wait for the disk I.O. to complete. So these not ready inbuffs are a way to kind of reserve space and room in the socket buffer. But you have to wait for the data to be ready before you can send it. So when we're doing SynFile with software TLS, we're still using the same kind of mechanism. And SynFile I.O. done normally um, when it was done for when you're not using TLS, at the point that the I.O. finishes, it says, oh, I have my data. I can mark these inbuffs as ready and kind of release TCP to start sending this data. When we're doing software TLS, we, we get the, the, disk, the pages back from the, from the disk interrupt handler, and we go, OK, we have our data, but it's not actually ready yet. So we're not going to mark them ready yet. Instead, now we're going to queue them for being encrypted by our, our worker pool. And then when the worker pool threads run, uh, in the case of SIN file, because it's file back data, they can't kind of modify that data in place, because we might have multiple different sockets in the same file. So they allocate a separate set of pages that are kind of anonymous to hold the encrypted data. They perform the encryption. And now that we've encrypted the data and we've modified, we have the fully kind of generated TLS frame, now at this point, we tell TCP, these inbuffs are ready. You can send them down all the way down to the NIC. All right, and that's marked ready. So with write, the, the workflow is kind of similar but a little different. So with write, um, we're going to start off, we have to use these external pages inbuffs. So when we're kind of copying data in from user land for write into inbuffs, we just make sure and pick the right kind of inbuff. And we're going to frame them with, with KTLS frame. Um, but we're going to explicitly mark these inbuffs as M not ready before we stick them in the socket buffer, kind of the way that SynFile does in plain SynFile or SynFile KTLS. So we're going to mark them not ready, and we're going to queue them with, to this worker pool thread to be encrypted. And the KTLS worker thread is going to run, but in this case, it doesn't have to allocate a separate copy of the data, because it knows that these aren't file back pages. They're not shared with anybody. They're anonymous. So instead of allocating more data, it just does the encryption in place and kind of modifies the data in place. And then once the encryption is finished, just like in the send file case at the end, um, it marks them as ready and kind of releases them to TCP. And then at this point, 
they're just M buffs in the, TC, in the socket buffer that TCP can play with, and kind of the normal role of TCP happens. The only thing that you need is your NIC at the bottom has to be aware of how to handle these unmapped M buffs. And we actually even have a way that if your NIC is not aware of how to handle unmapped M buffs, we'll kind of unpackage them and turn them into plain M buffs um, at kind of at the level of about IP output or so. So the benefits of software TLS, well, A, we've kind of cut out all the bouncing around between kernel and newsline. We get to use SIN file. We're not making any extra copies and so forth for the most part. But we reduce them. But we're still having the CPU touch the data. So we're still spending a bit more CPU cycles than like stock SIN file without TLS at all. Um, and, and for SIN file from a file in particular, we're still having to actually do at least one copy because we can't trash the file data and override it in place. We have to allocate a second set of pages to store the encrypted content. So that leads into and, okay, we'll on, something called NIC TLS, which is the second mode that we have. And this is the mode that involves having a NIC that's smart enough to understand how to do TLS framing and encryption inside the NIC. So, with NIC TLS, when we invoke the socket option kind of way back at the beginning to switch a socket into KTLS mode, we'll go look to see does your NIC support this feature. If it does, we're going to allocate this thing called a SIN tag. Um, a SIN, SIN tags are this um, feature we added recently to FreeBSD. It's in, I think it's in 12, and it's currently used for something called packet pacing or rate limiting where you can configure for certain sockets that data will kind of be paced out of the NIC at a certain rate. Even if you queue a whole bunch up in the socket, it just doesn't send them all at once. It kind of paces them out at some rate you defined, or this TCP stack defines in certain cases. Well, that relies on some kind of infrastructure where at the socket layer, we can kind of find out what NIC we're attached to by the route and allocate a, a kind of a handle on this fe on a feature, like a handle on the ability to do rate limiting. Or in this case, we've added a new type of syntag, which is a handle to having a TLS session. Um, and the, the and plus part of the syntag, the driver gets to store some kind of opaque driver-specific data. So in, in particular, I worked on NIC TLS um, for the Chelsea OT6 as part of the work that I've done. And so on the T6, we actually get to upload the keys that you've given us for the session into the card so that when the card is doing encryption, it can kind of read the keys internally inside the NIC and do fewer DMAs. So one of the things we store in this driver-specific data for T6 is the location in, in the card's memory of where we stored your keys so that when the session goes away, we can kind of free that out to be reused by a future session. And, and other, we actually hold quite a bit more state than that. But we've, whatever state we need, we get to hold, um, as, and get, get to kind of hang off of the syn tag. Um, another kind of difference from software TLS is that instead of this kind of dance of marking MBUFs not ready, either because write has been called, or in the case of syn file, when syn file IO done completes and we have our data from the disk, we're not going to kind of worry about is that MBUF encrypted or not. We're just going to send it straight down to, M to TCP the way it is. So we're going to allow unencrypted MBUFs to flow all the way down TCP to the NIC. Um, and in particular, the MBUF keeps its reference to this TLS session object so the NIC can see it because the NIC is going to look at this reference inside the MBUF to get back to its syntag to get back to its kind of notion of what the TLS session is and what data it needs to perform the encryption. And um, in the case of NIC TLS, um, we might have to retransmit a TLS frame or part of it. And if we have to do that, we need to make sure we keep around the state necessary to encrypt the record or the part of the record the second or third or however many times it takes to get the record out the door until it's actually acted and removed from the uh, socket buffer entirely. So as long as the MBUF is alive and it's living in the socket buffer, we're going to keep a reference on the session object. So um, another really key thing um, that I was paranoid about for NIC TLS is um, when syntags were first brought into um, FreeBSD for rate limiting purposes, they were somewhat lazy in that they, if, if your route changed to a NIC that didn't support, if your route changed to another NIC that did support rate limiting, it would kind of pause the flow of traffic, basically kept throwing away data and forcing TCP to retransmit until it got a chance to allocate a new syntag on your new NIC that could preserve the pacing parameters you wanted. But it relied on the NIC driver kind of to notice that it had been giving a packet for the wrong thing, and the NIC driver itself had to notice. And if a NIC driver doesn't support rate limiting, it doesn't bother doing the check. 
So if your route changes from a, from a card that supports rate limiting to a card that doesn't, we just keep sending the data without bothering about the fact that we can't rate limit. And that's fine for rate limiting because it's kind of optional. For TLS, that would be very bad. Because if I'm on, if I have a connection that's on a NIC that knows how to do TLS offloading and I've kind of negotiated that and reserved that capability, um, and then I have to move the connection because of a route change, or for example, if you have two ports in a lag and you have fill over from one to the other, um, we don't want to just start sending those frames out the other NIC without having a session in place. Because then we're sending unencrypted data on the wire. Like, it's just bad for, I don't have to explain why that's bad. So, um, one of the things we do is in IP output, we actually verify right at that, because at IP output is the last chance and we'll kind of decide what the route really is and which interface we're talking to when it can't change from then on out. Like we're committed to talking this interface. At that point in time, we will check to see, does the interface that we're going to send this packet to match the interface inside of the syntag? Because the syntag actually knows its interface. It's part of the, the, the public part of the data structure. And if it doesn't, then we kind of, oh no, we can't do that. So we'll throw it away. Um, we actually queue a task to kind of allocate a new syntag on the new NIC so that a connection can migrate from one NIC to the other if they both support NIC TLS. Um, but in, I kind of had a general, a general change to syntax to add this to IP output that's in this change earlier this summer. And KTLS just extends that so that for TLS syntax, we do the same check to make sure we don't leak unencrypted data on the wire. So that is there. We're aware of that. Um, and then finally, assuming it does match, we're going to send that the, the, uh, the inbuff gets passed down to the NIC just like a normal inbuff would. And the NIC driver is responsible for noticing that this inbuff has a TLS syntag on it, and then going, okay, I have to handle this one a little specially and queue it off, you know, whatever, however I have to deal with TLS frames, I have to do the special work to make sure that this one gets set as a TLS frame and gets encrypted as part of going onto the wire. So the workflow for NIC TLS is we have the pages, and we only have green pages, because we don't do the encryption on the host anymore, and the host CPU never sees the encrypted data. We get the data from the disk, via buffer cache or DMA, and we send that unencrypted data straight out to the NIC, and then the NIC, as part of taking the data post-DMA, but before it goes onto the wire, it does the TLS framing. And so this picture looks an awful lot like using SIN file without TLS at all. Right? From the CPU's perspective, it looks just like we're not even using TLS for the most part. It has to do a little bit of bookkeeping to kind of tag them as TLS records and so forth. But for the most part, we're getting to reuse one exact, we're back to zero copy, we're not making extra copies and so forth. So we avoid the copies that come from software, the, the one copy we still have left from software team at uh, TLS, and our CPU is no longer touching the data at all, just like it would in plain um, send file. And we have a workflow that's very similar. All right, we've got two minutes, we're gonna have to go fast. All right, the last thing that you probably all actually care about, talk a little bit about some numbers. Um, the first set of numbers I have are on stock FreeBSD because I, I want to tell you how it works on stock FreeBSD. Um, so for my purposes, I have some test boxes in my lab at Chelsea that I use to test this stuff. They're not the beefiest things in the world. Um, so there are a couple of four core boxes with hyperthreading. Um, they're like Haswell or something. Um, and they have... Uh, so they have upper threading, and they have a, a couple of T6 100 gigabits NICs hooked up back to back, so no switch in the middle. One of the hard parts of actually trying to do this is that OpenSSL or TLS in general is pretty taxing on the RX side. So trying to actually generate enough load from a receiver to pull traffic from the server to see how, how much you can push the server is kind of hard. Um, the way I've managed to do this is on my receiver, I make use of Chelsea. They have a, we have a, another mode where you can do TLS using the TCP offload engine, and that can offload both RX and TX. Um, I make use of that, and I run 16 instances of OpenSSL. They have this kind of, I said S-Client. It's actually S-Time. S-Time just kind of runs in a loop trying to refetch the same URL all over again, and it has a nice benefit that when it reads data, it throws it away. If you do something like fetch to dev null, it's still writing to dev null, which still adds overhead. Um, so this is kind of, if I should fix it, it's S time. This is kind of the lowest possible bent, like, receiver I could find, and that paired with using toad TLS meant that I could actually pull about as much traffic as my server could generate. Um, and the server what I'm using is I'm using Nginx. It has some patches to be aware of KTLS because Nginx has to be aware that, uh, hey, I can actually use SIN file some of the time on SSL. Because by default, Nginx is like, SSL, I don't get to use SIN file. 
So we have patches to Nginx um, to deal with a, some patches to open SSL to add basically this SSL sin file function. And that's the testing setup I used. And then lastly, for the purposes of these tests, I only used AES GCM with a 256-bit key for my cipher. All right, so what are some numbers? So between these two boxes, I ran, they have four cores, so I ran Nginx in two different configs, in particular, to kind of be a little more fair to when you don't have KTLS. Um, having just one worker or having four workers to kind of do as much software encryption in your land as you can. The first line is just, we're not using KTLS at all. And so it's actually with four workers able to do 30 gigabits, which is pretty good. And keep in mind that um, the uh, OpenSSL is probably using ASNI in user land, which is just as efficient in user land as it is in the kernel. And that's probably why it's getting to 30 gigabits. The next one I have, when I added KTLS, I needed a way that you could use it out of the box on kind of arbitrary platforms. So I have a little front end, um, a little KTLS software back end that knows how to use the open crypto framework in the kernel, which I, I don't have the fondest feelings for our open crypto framework, but that's a topic for another day. Um, but it's there so that in theory you could run this even on like ARM or other architectures. So the first benchmark I ran is using kind of our dumbest plain C versions of Cypher. And that, that doesn't do very well. It's, like, it's, it's worse than doing it in user land. It's only three gigabits. Um, but then I tried using actually, uh, like using ASNI with OCF, so our, our internal crypto framework. And that actually gets a pretty respectable 36 gigabits per second. So that's the, kind of the benefit of, instead of doing the extra copies and so forth, compared to having the four workers in user land, that 30 to 36 is kind of just moving the bits into the kernel and reducing the number of data copies. Um, just also to show, uh, I also use Chelsea's kind of, their T6 has the ability to kind of do crypto on the side where you DMA the crypto request and it comes back. And that gets about the same numbers as ASNI. Part of the reason these numbers aren't as good as they can be is that OCF doesn't allow you to do, it, it requires you to do crypto in place currently, which means that when you're doing send file and it wants to encrypt from one page into a destination page, we have to manually do a big mem copy before we ask the crypto engine to do its job, which kind of defeats the purpose. Like in the case of CCR, it does DMA. It would be really nice to just tell it, read from the one place and write to the other and skip the mem copy, and that would cut out a chunk of overhead. So that's kind of future work to make it less terrible. Um, the Netflix has, Oh, no, I've got to end very quickly here. Netflix has a version of ASNI effectively that uses Intel's ESA-L crypto library, and that one gets a more respectable 48 gigabits. And then uh, testing with using the Chelsea OT6 and NIC TLS mode, um, it's between kind of 60 and 72. And what you would do is if you're using NIC TLS, you would just only have the one worker and devote as much cores as you can to doing the work that you need to do inside the kernel. Um, I can get into why it's 70, but we're not today. So I have a few numbers from Netflix that I will mostly gloss over. Suffice it to say, they have some local changes inside of TCP and other things that allow them to do better. <laughs> um, they're able to get closer to 90, even with software TLS. Um, but for example, using T6, they're able to use less CPU to get to 90 gigabits than they are when they're using ESA-L inside the kernel to do it. Um, and the, one of the main benefits that they were concerned about originally was memory bandwidth. And so this is a, from a slide from a while back, some numbers I got from Drew at Netflix comparing the memory bandwidth you can measure with PCM comparing software and NICTLS. All right, we're gonna skip this slide. You can read it later. Um, we're gonna, you can read this later too, it has the URLs. The kernel bits are committed, like the framework itself. T6's NICTLS is not yet merged. I have a review for a port that is at, Basically, Netflix's ESA L thing, it works. Uh, that's actually the one that I tested in the benchmarks. Um, there are patches to OpenSSL. So, OpenSSL has patches upstream in their masters that are not in 111 that came from Mellanox that work with Linux's KTLS layer, which actually works pretty much just like the one in FreeBSD. It uses a, like a message on send message to send special records the same way, for example, it supports send file. So, this KTLS master branch is a much smaller, it's just adding the FreeBSD bits. Um, and so I'm hoping to upstream that soon. We've got to get a little more paperwork in place. But that's pretty much ready to be upstreamed um, in the near future. And then I have patches for Nginx. Um, because there were some changes in what got pushed into OpenSSL master, there's a slightly different branch for testing against OpenSSL master, like the arguments to SSL send file changed and some other minor stuff. All right. We don't have time to talk about this. Um, except that it's being worked on. This one I almost had 
I got it to do a simple file transfer last night, but then it couldn't do more than that. Otherwise, I would have numbers today. And Drew has started working on TLS 1.3. He has like the ESA L version of that working, I think, was it like two weeks ago. All right, I do not want to skip this part. So, as I said at the very beginning, um, I get the privilege of up, being up here and talking in front of you about this stuff, but this is the product of a lot of people spending a lot of time working on this. Um, so two folks who started working on this at the beginning at Netflix were Scott Long and Randall Stewart, and they kind of did the initial groundwork for um, having some notion, a way of kind of doing software TLS. I know they played with various things like treating it like checksum offloading and doing it like right in front of the NIC versus where they moved it eventually to be in front of TCP, which works better. Like, so they learned that painful hard lesson and we just kind of get the design that sets the fruits of that. Um, after that point, Drew ended up kind of taking the work that they had started and modifying it. He's the one who added this notion of external pages for SIN file even without TLS and then applied that to how TLS worked. Um, I think before a TLS frame was actually stored as a chain of MBUFs instead of one solitary MBUF, which doesn't work well for things like Nick TLS. So Drew changed that. He also added the notion that you could have multiple backends of, for software TLS with different priorities. And then in my part, um, the main thing I've worked on is I came into this thinking about how do we allow a Chelsea or T6 to plug into this and kind of do the NIC TLS mode. So I kind of worked on the framework for extending it to handle NIC TLS in addition to software TLS and then the T6 bits. Um, and you know, the first three guys on here, they're all Netflix employees. So they were funded by Netflix. Um, for myself, I was funded both by Chelsea and Netflix to work on this. So thank all those people. And then that's all I got. And I think I have zero time for questions. So you can hit me up in the hall. All right? Thanks, guys.